Well, I thought it was a piece of truck. Yeah. So that's the first fish. A lot of bait out here this morning on a beautiful morning. Very still. But we're looking for trout. I'm trying to find, trying to fish on grass over grass beds. I'm throw a jerk bait a couple of times. That's one of Chaz's new. Oh, okay. It's his new one. Is that like two to four feet? Yeah. It rises. A, it's more of a floating. It's a floater. Yeah, it looks good. Now yeah, this bait really has a lot of side to side movement. Wow. Very agile. Just jumps around crazy. Oh, there's a fish. the new matrix shad rip shad really dances in the water it's really good in the water it's a it's actually a floating slow rising jerk bait Got a lip on it oh, actually the trout Take note of the grass that keeps coming up with these fish. There's one. Still. Oh yeah. Gets down in the grass. So when we refer to grass and fishing over grass here in, on the Gulf Coast, especially Louisiana, because that's my, mostly my reference point, is that we're talking about submerged aquatic vegetation. And that is not a singular group of organisms. Uh, there are a variety of these plants, and some of them are better than others when it comes to fishing. So I'm going to pull information from a couple of different sources on this video. But the first one I want to look at is a graduate thesis done by Noelle Marie Branner. And uh, she was, uh, LS, this is from the LSU University, uh, Habitat Preferences of Adult Spotted Sea Trout in Lake Pontchartrain, Louisiana. And, and there's a lot of information in here. Um, and she has, she was very thorough uh, on the study of sea trout. So there's a lot of interesting things to, to look at, but so I'm only going to look at the submerged aquatic vegetation at, or SAV. So I'm going to, there's going to be a lot of reference to SAV in this video. So from a fishing standpoint, one of the first things that would be helpful to identify would be to see what differences there are between these different types of seagrass or this SAV vegetation. And Noel refers to a study by Duffy and Waltz from a paper in 1998, but it's work that was done from 1991 to 1993. And they're seeking to quantify the difference in distribution and abundance of fish species between the unvegetated areas, uh, the native SUV, and the patches of the invasive species. So what their research showed was that the community diversity was the highest in the beds of Via Americana, which is eelgrass. It was intermediate in mud bottoms, and it was the lowest in either the R. maritima, which is widgeon grass, or in the M. spicatum. And additionally, they go on to say that fish species were determined to be more abundant in the vegetated areas when compared to adjacent regions consisting of mud bottom only. So that is indeed what David and I are doing today. We're out looking for the areas that have SAV 
so that we can fish over those areas because certainly this time of the year they are going to be more productive than just the mud bottom itself. And Noel points out other research that specifically points to reasons that the community diversity is better uh, among these areas with the SAV versus just soft mud bottoms and, and, and such. And, and specifically mentioning you know, a, a habitat for young brown shrimp, young crabs, and even juvenile sea trout that will come in. You know, of course, they, they are spawned out in the salty water, and then they, the eggs uh, and, and the larva will move in from inside to the estuary, come in with the tides, they'll move in, and they need to find areas like this. So, as was pointed out, the eelgrass is the best environment, but unfortunately, if you look at this chart, you'll see that there's been a decline of the eelgrass, which is the blue bar, in Lake Pontchartrain. Now, this data is from 1996 to 2000. I don't have any more recent data than that, but just to point out the decline of the eelgrass and the increase of the re repeal of which this is the widgeon grass which this is a, a grass that's uh, maybe a bit hardier it's a uri haline species it, it's very hardy and it has taken over some of the areas and i know you've seen this grass uh, this is what it looks like it has that branching uh, that the branching stems you catch this stuff on your hooks it seems to be uh, your hooks catch a lot more of it than the eelgrass does because the eelgrass has thinner leaves and this is eelgrass. Eelgrass can also grow really tall and actually lay over but for the eelgrass where the, the beds, the leaves are shorter and it's growing on the bottom, this is like fishing heaven. Jeez, John, I can see my lure. Yeah, four feet. Shells on the bottom. Yeah. Three to four. Oh, there's one. All that's right. A, that's a decent that's fish, a keeper. too. That's nice. Beautiful fish. Yeah. Ooh, nice. Nothing prettier than a trunk. Oh, sweet John. All right. Bye-bye bottom. Hello, jerk. That is... That's my first cast. First cast, beautiful 16 inch trout Gorgeous. on that matrix shad, rip shad. Oof. That is pretty. Beautiful fish. This area of Lake Pontchartrain shoreline had a lot of beds of mostly eelgrass that were submerged down to as much as two feet. But the water was very clear and you could actually identify where the beds were the by the line. mullet that you would scare up or just see swimming on the surface above the beds. There's one. Oh, I saw that one come up. Take it. That's a, that's a decent sized fish too. Came right up, and there's another one swimming with it. It's a nice fish. It's there's one that's bigger. That's a bigger one. So we caught quite a few trout, but only in the one area were they very big. Uh, but the pattern's definitely some shallow, probably beds in two to three feet seem to work well. These are grass beds. And mullet around. It seems like the trout mix in with the bigger mullet. And they certainly hang around. They probably attack from inside the schools of bigger mullet. Not on bigger mullet, but on small ones. And the jerk baits have definitely been productive. And there's another very interesting paper that I ran across with some really good information about the submerged aquatic vegetation 
specifically on the Louisiana coast and around Lake Pontchartrain, and it's very helpful in understanding where this grows and where uh, we might expect to find these if we're looking for places to fish. And this paper is from the, the was published in the journal Aquatic uh, Botany. Uh, Kristen DeMarco is the main author. So submerged aquatic vegetation mapping in coastal Louisiana through the development of a spatial likelihood occurrence model. So the point of what they're doing here is to create a model that could predict where the mo the best places for this SAV to show up. That way for the folks doing the coastal restoration, they would know where to plant uh, or introduce plantings of this grass and, and expect it to be able to take root and flourish in those areas. So an interesting thing to note that the growing season of the SAV is loosely defined as summer months when temperature and light avail availability are high enough for growth. So this vegetation needs light to grow, like all vegetation, almost all vegetation. Uh, and so you're going to see that bloom in the summertime and then into the late fall, which is what we're seeing right now. We've had a pretty, we've had a very warm fall and uh, there's still a lot of growth. There's very healthy SAV beds right now around the coastal area, the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. So of course, as a fisherman, I wanna know where I could expect to find this grass. I can't just drive everywhere looking for the grass. I need to have some idea of where it might be. And Marco here in her paper points out that there are th three primary drivers. And of course, she's creating a model that would predict where it is. And, and we'll look at it a bit more in depth about that. And so DeMarco points out three primary drivers for this, and that is the mean winter salinity, the turbidity of the water, and exposure. And when she, when she talks about exposure, that's, that's just identified by the potential high wave wind energy at any particular site. So she goes on to explain how these three conditions will affect the growth of the SAV. And in regard to winter mean salinity, you can see that the probability of the presence of the SUV is higher with the lower salinity. So as the salinity goes up, the probability of the presence of the grass goes down. So we know that here in Southeast Louisiana, the Mississippi River is controlling the salinity. And when the river is high, the salinity is low. When the river is low, the salinity is high. We also have this reflectance or actually uh, turbidity as a measure of reflectance. So again, similar thing where you, you have a higher probability of the seagrass growth where you have low turbidity. And that, that's just an obvious thing because these are plants and the plants need sunlight. So if the water's turbid, they can't get enough sunlight, so they're not going to grow well. And then the third one is the exposure. Again, the exposure was, is, is exposure to strong uh, water, I guess wave action by storms, by, by wind. So if you have exposed areas with no protection, the exposure gets higher. And so you can see that the general trend is with as there's more exposure, the probability goes down. Though this seems to be, uh, there's a lot more uncertainty. All this gray area just represents the uncertainty of that. So uh, apparently, I, I believe part of it is that some of the SAV is more tolerant to wave action than other. And I think eelgrass is, is susceptible, uh, more susceptible to the exposure. So it may be down in, in this area uh, in the uncertainty curve, meaning uh, it's not going to do as well in the area with areas with high exposure. So let's look at what their model showed. You can see here that they've mapped 
basically the whole coast of Louisiana. And the, the, the low probability of the SAV is in the, is in the light, is in the pink to purple and, and then into the blue. The highest prob probability is red, orange, yellow, green. And so if we look closer at this, we'll see that, you know, again, we're looking, we want to see brown, yellow, green. As you can see it in this area, the areas with purple and blue are not good. So all these areas along the fringes, really most of Biloxi, a lot of Biloxi Marsh here uh, is not good, does not have good conditions or probability for SAV growth. Uh, down here on the, the Mississippi Delta out here, there's some really high probability areas, and we know that to be the case. You know, there's, there's a lot of really good bass fishing uh, and, and a lot of good fishing out here, and there's a lot of submerged aquatic vegetation. Again, Delacro, very high probability going way out past Four Horse, out here into some of these outer lakes, very good probability. Uh, Lake Pontchartrain, there's good, much better probability along the North Shore here than you know the Southwest Shore, and of course along the City Shore, they're really not showing anything kind of poor, but good probabilities in parts of the Rigolese, uh along the Chef Mentor area, the Bayou Bienvenu area has some high probability in there as well. So if we go back to Noelle's paper, we'll see that she also talks about the probability of the SAV around Lake Pontchartrain. And you can see that here the, uh, the probability of abundance are the red areas. Common is blue and infrequent is yellow. So you can see that she also points out that this whole North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain is either abundant or common. And parts of you know, the Irish Bayou area and going down toward the Chef, uh, parts of you know the top of sort of on the other side of Lake Catherine there. This is all areas that could potentially support an abundance or at least a common occurrence of the SAV. bait is very agile in the water, really moves a lot, really excited about the action on this bait, I like the size, it's got, they've, they've got some nice colors, Matrix Shad has some nice colors on, on this bait, I think this is going to be a really good bait. Ooh, that's a nice one, that's a keeper, there we go, right on, hit that rip shed, that's got a nice green with a like a holographic kind of gold and it's a nice color too. I like those kind of green, olive green baits for our waters. The one thing I really like about this bait is that, again, we're, like David said, we're fishing this thing hard. I mean, just slamming it and it doesn't roll over. It's very controlled. It's got a big wobble. It probably moves four inches out of the, uh, uh, to the side and then back in again but it won't roll over. So you can work it really fast with really hard jerks and it won't flip over. That's a very nice controlled action. This has been a good day on Lake Pontchartrain. I haven't fished Lake Pontchartrain for, I don't know, a year? It's been a long time because we had all the Bonacary Spillway, Mississippi River water from the Bonacary Spillway and it was really messed up. Great to see trout back here. We didn't catch anything huge today, but we caught a lot. I and mean, you throw in the, if you count the, th the throwbacks, we caught an awful lot of trout. And uh, mostly on grass beds, pretty much. Uh, or or some, sometimes it was in grass beds that were just two foot of water, three foot of water. Uh, but this last while we've been drifting in about four or five foot of water. And uh, I think there is grass here as well, but we're, quite a bit deeper 
and I caught every fish. Today I caught every fish on this Matrix Shad Rip Shad. It's this new jerkbait they have coming out. I don't know if it's available in stores yet or not, but it looks like it's going to be a really good bait. It was the fish really responded to it today. So yeah, in Lake Ponch Train, catching fish all day on a jerk bait. How's that for a day? Anyway, if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, just hit the subscribe button and the. I don't know if you're aware but that little bell as well if you click that it'll notify you when my videos come out otherwise uh, it may not tell you that it came out but anyway hope you can get out soon